Hi, I'm Kerry Walker from jobs.ac.uk and I'd like to welcome you back to the second of our HE recruitment webinar sessions, which are taking place instead of our usual in-person event held annually at the campus at the Warwick University. We hope you were able to catch the first session last week, which was the future of work. Uh, we'll see including those from Queen Mary and Ashton University, but if not, then don't worry, we will be sending out a link for all the sessions to everyone who's registered. Last week's event, including this one today, will also be available on our jobs.ac.uk YouTube channel shortly. We also have our third webinar session, the HR Managers Forum, next Thursday the 18th from 12 to 1 where you have the chance to submit questions to our panel on any pressing challenges or topics that you may have at this present time. And I'm sure there'll be some. And the aim of these sessions and webinars are to bring us back together. And they're also to inform exchange knowledge on topical conversations within recruitment and HR for those working in higher education. And we hope you find them all interesting, informative and useful. You can submit your questions throughout today in the live Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. So please do submit questions to our panel. So to today's session and our theme, Rebuilding the Workforce. We have two speakers for today and the first up is Graham Hunter. Graham Hunter is the director of VY and leads their people consulting business for education, policing and local government and their organisation design community of practice. Graham will be talking to you about the changes in the nature of work and the impact and pressures COVID-19 has had on the higher education sector. This session will look at key things HEs need to consider in rebuilding the workforce. So Graham, over to you. Thank you, Kerry. Really pleased to be here. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to try and talk about two things. If I can get my system to move on. So firstly, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, what is changing in the workplace more broadly and how that is impacting on higher education. The premise of that being that we're in an unprecedented crisis at the moment, but what that is really doing is accelerating things we were already seeing and bringing different types of modernization to the top of the agenda. And then in terms of rebuilding the workforce, I want to sort of think about a few things um, for in particular. So one is how, when and where will work be done in the future? The second is about how do you think about the skills you're going to need and get those skills in place? The third one being about how does that mean that HR models need to change and different and support models across universities need to change? And then finally, thinking about the structure for that new kind of operating reality. So I'll talk about those things. I'm a consultant for EY. I'm trained to talk, so there's a good chance I will just get into it and keep going. So Kerry, keep me bright and prompt me if I need to accelerate. So the world of work in 2021. So COVID has brought in a new era. era. So if you think about it in terms of numbers, 91% um, of the population across the globe has been under some kind of lockdown restriction. So that's 7 billion people. And what that has done has led to a real steep increase in working from home, which we've all experienced. So in two weeks last March, 50% of people were working from home, working remotely and an increase in digital adoption. So in one week last March, more than 60 million downloads of video conferencing app, apps took place. So two years ago, we weren't really using video conferencing for this kind of thing. Now we're using it. And what that has meant is a real focus in organisations around employee well-being because now we're all sitting at screens separate from each other. There's a real concern in most employers about how that is impacting on people and their experience of the world of work. More remote working. Um, we are doing this remotely. Most of our days are remote. Um, agile working models, so really working with different people, so the people we would have worked with in the past, working more flexibly, a different leadership style, and the best way to illustrate that is that I manage people at EY and previously my job was largely about performance and feedback and development and increasingly it's about are they getting the downtime they need, have they got issues at home, are they juggling school, homeschooling with their day to day business and then digitalization. So technology has become much more the heart of how organizations work. I think arguably though, 
what that is really doing is just making things happen much quicker than were already happening. So if you think about digital, one of my clients had been rolling out teams and thinking about Office 365 for about a year and actually ended up rolling it out in six weeks last April and May because they just needed it suddenly to do their business. It just really accelerated that process. It's accelerated the extent to which organisations are using automation and artificial intelligence to think about how they serve customer demand. It's increased remote working. So in the university space, you will have seen more blended learning and more online learning. And, and just that has really picked up pace. It was all there anyway, but COVID has provided impetus to it. And what is really interesting is that as we get to the end of this crisis um, and we are seeing organisations look ahead as vaccines come on stream to a more normal road of working, that is not slowing down. Actually, organisations have now got a point where they have to decide how do they bring people back into the office? How will people work in the future? So what COVID has really done has changed things that were changing anyway, just much, much quicker. For higher education, if you if we'd done this last summer, we would have been talking about some apocalyptic scenarios in terms of international students and enrolments and revenue and sources of income being impacted. Um, but there were a number of changes around student cap removals, A level grades and kind of economic contraction more broadly that meant that enrolments held up better than we anticipated they would do. So while there has been kind of declines in international students, it's not been the kind of 30 to 50 percent doomsday scenario. It's been more like 15 to 25 percent. So that means HE has revenue shortfalls, but the impact of that's been less than that has been expected. And actually it's been less even than has been expected. So some universities have done better out of this process than others. And largely when we talk because we're talking about rebuilding the workforce, what are we inheriting to rebuild? Staff costs has been one area where universities have gone to balance the books, but it's not been redundancies, it's been pay freezes, reduced hours, furlough, um, halting the renewal of fixed term contracts. Only really distressed universities have tended to use significant amounts of redundancy levels. They've also deferred capex on facilities. Um, in IT, that's continued because they've had to invest in the technology to make the university work, but they deferred capex. And then discretionary services, catering, security facilities have sort of borne the brunt of the of the reductions in service. So actually, there is a workforce to rebuild here. And actually, one theme I'd come back to as we go through this is that a lot of that is not about more people. It's about the employee experience that you're trying to rebuild and how do you move into a different way of working. But in universities, and I'm currently working with two Russell Group universities, and what their what were the, the thoughts tend to be is that COVID has pushed up the agenda, online blended. You know, students are still going to expect some level of online learning. So how do you get the right balance between face to face and tutorials, lab sessions, and and remote learning? Um, back office systems and automation has been a real constraint on universities for some time. And actually the ability to automate some of the repetitive stuff and improve efficiency and improve student experience through that, through that is going higher up the agenda. What is the right portfolio of courses? So never waste a good, good crisis as the, as the saying goes. Universities are looking at what is the right balance of portfolio and courses they want to do for the future. What's their balance between research and teaching? centralization of admin functions we're currently looking at that with a university that age-old balance of which bits sit in schools or faculties which bits sit in departments which bits are centralized is a real live issue and a balance between experience and efficiency is is a very kind of ongoing discussion and then consolidation of estates because if you've got fewer people at work then you need few buildings to hold them in what does that estate of the future look like probably more laboratories, more small spaces, less big teaching rooms. And then finally, thinking about optimization of services so that they work more effectively and just add more value to the organization. So what we're seeing in universities in common with other sectors is that things that were already happening are happening quicker as a result of COVID. And in thinking about rebuilding the workforce, therefore, it's about rebuilding that in a different form. And there aren't any stock answers 
But what I'm going to try and do in the next few minutes is just ask some of the questions that we think and we are seeing organisations ask around hybrid, HR functions, skills, supply and demand and workforce restructuring and give you some kind of context about what is going on both in universities and elsewhere. So from a hybrid point of view, I know you've talked about remote working already, so I'm not going to labour this, but for the challenges around hybrid are less about technology than they are about people and what the future of your employee experience is. Um, there is a general consensus that hybrid working will continue in some form, um, but actually the people experience is critical. We have worked with a lot of organisations across all sectors from insurance to, to banking, to public services, to universities. And whenever we ask them what are the biggest challenges they face, um, culture, inclusion, and well-being and mental wellness comes out top all industries everybody has a concern about what this means for the culture of organizations and the experience of people to some extent that might dissipate when people go back into offices at least part-time but that leads you to a second challenge which is employees want to work in a hybrid way and have flexibility about where they work and when they work in a physical co-location co-location but if you don't plan that, you end up with some really negative impacts on productivity and efficiency. So the, the study by George Washington University, which looked at what the chances were on that middle graph of two employees being in the office at the same time, if they were allowed to work three days remotely every week, said that there was only basically a one in 10 chance that they would be in the office at the same time. So if you're there seeing off the office as a place of collaboration and joint working, but they're not there together, that's just not productive, it's not efficient, and it means you're not planning the organisation in an effective way. So there are, therefore, some emerging archetypes about how universities and other organisations are thinking about this, and it varies. It will vary for different faculties, it will vary for different departments, but at one end there is the traditional view of work as a place you go to and you do things, and that is probably most, that's kind of one extreme, and the other extreme is works and activity. You do it anywhere. And those two things are very different employee experiences and very different in terms of how you structure and grow the workforce and recruit skills to do it. Um, and then in the middle, there are different models around how you use the office to connect people or to attract people or to collaborate. And at the first question really, as you start to rebuild the workforce, is what are you rebuilding? Where are people going to go? How will it work? That will be different for a medical school compared to your HR function. It will be different for your finance function compared to your procurement function. But without having that view, it's difficult to understand what your st strategy is for your talent. How do you attract the right people? How do you develop the right people? Um, can you look at attracting people from other geographies who wouldn't be within commuting distance if you're more flexible about location, for example. So that's the first thing to think about. So what is the future of your employee experience? And really central to that is what do they think and feel? So we encourage organisations to survey everybody, not just talk to the Pro Vice Chancellor, but talk to everyone at all levels of the organisation and take a data led approach to that. Increasingly, experience is equal to performance. I'm sure if we all think about our experience of working remotely, we know that we've learnt about how do we, how are we as individuals productive? How do we set ourselves up for success? So what experience are you trying to provide and therefore what's your strategy? And then what's your future model of work? So what are your different ways of, that you're going to work? How will different bits of your organisation work? How will they collaborate in future? So that's the kind of first set of questions for me as you think about rebuilding the workforce. The second question is, do you know the skills you have and the skills you need? And starting with, do you know the skills you have? Um, it's quite common for us to talk to organisations that are tell telling us about skills gaps and capabilities they don't have and things they need to build. And they, typically will default to how do we recruit them, how do we grow them, how do we develop that. The first thing we often find is that they have those skills already, they're just dispersed in different bits of the organisation and different faculties or schools or departments and they're not making optimal use of that. So thinking differently about how you use your people's skills 
is the first part of that equation. The second is, what is the workforce you actually require in terms of skill sets, capabilities, learning specialisms, teaching specialisms? What are you going to need to do it? And then what's the right way of securing those skills? So are they all employees? If they are, are they fixed? Are they non-fixed? So all of that's traditional. But increasingly, organisations use contractors and partnerships and technology to supplement their skill sets and to focus people in the right areas. And then for universities, you have this age old dilemma of where do they sit in the organisation? Are they central? Are they faculty based? There are four real things to think about. So have you got enough people in the right place? The capacity point at the top there. Um, do those people have the right capabilities to deliver on your objectives? Um, what is the right blend of your workforce between contingent workforce, permanent employees, use of automation to, do, to give some transactional support? Um, and then are you balancing that with the cost base of the workforce? Our experience is it's perfectly possible to actually run an organisation with a smaller cost base and more capabilities if you think about the model in advance. Lots of words on this slide, but my key points are this has to fit within an overall view of your HR life cycle. So you have to think about that skills agenda, both in terms of how you source and attract and qualify and select the right people, but also about what's your learning and development model to help them be productive quickly. How do you retain and develop them? What's your, how do you support them to move across the organisation to develop new skills and to work with different people? And how do you underpin that with technology and data so that you're taking a kind of evidence-led approach to it. Again, this is about employee experience, it's about talent strategy, it's about how you develop and move the organisation in a slightly different direction. So from a skills point of view, are you making the most of what you have? Are you using the right approaches to sourcing the skills or just relying on recruitment? And does your employee experience help you to attract and retain the talent? that you need because we all know it's much easier to retain good people than to recruit good people. Third point, is your HR model focused on the right things? HR models are changing. Increasingly, if you look at this picture, the left hand side are your customers, so the employees, the managers, the people that you're working with across the organisation, students even. And increasingly, a lot of the interaction with those people is being automated, so new technology allows chat bots and artificial intelligence to provide a really good experience to those people empowered by data and new, new uses of the cloud. And that gives HR functions a chance to think about different things. So to think about experience, to think about workforce vitality, to think about how they help the organisation to achieve its strategy through building the right workforce, to think about how they enable people and teach people and move people in the right direction. So the core components of that are digital people to end. So increasing that technology is more and more important to support and to connect the workforce and to provide the insights the organisation needs to sort of needs to thrive and to develop. Um, a more kind of consultative approach around HR where you're more driving the change and supporting the organisation to achieve its objectives. And then more cross-functional working. So increasingly thinking about HR as a way that connects different faculties or different departments and helps them to think through challenges and join up to find solutions rather than doing it in isolated silos. So the HR model we think is going to change and will move beyond the, the kind of traditional business partnering and transactional support model. So key questions. Are you empowering the workforce to self-serve? Does your technology support this? Um, and can you actually go further and use HR as a catalyst? So when you're rebuilding the workforce, you're driving a strategy and not just thinking about how you source particular role. And then the final point, um, are you thinking differently about the structures that you use? Because I don't think you can think about how you rebuild without thinking about how you organise those people. And this is what I spend my most of my day is doing. Increasing numbers of organisations are following and more digital companies are and leading to flatter, less rigid, rigid and more agile organisations. And the evidence base that they are positive changes is actually getting to be pretty good. So 
organizations that do it see typically a huge increase in satisfaction because they have more feedback and insights from their people and more multidisciplinary um, collaborations for customers see a better outcome. They get new pro new services, new things to the market quicker because they prioritize and they focus on getting those, th those things done and they work with much shorter development cycles. They get higher levels of engagement because people feel like they own it and they're motivated and they're working on things they're passionate about and they're more productive and, and more effective because the short sprint allows you to very quickly iron out inefficiencies in process and, and management and coordination costs that you previously have. And I think this is an interesting one for universities because traditionally there's been quite a, a rigid organisational structure, but there's more and more pressure for interfaculty, multidisciplinary working on research and teaching. And does that give you the ability to make some of your structures less rigid? to think about different ways of structuring the organisation. And when we talk about doing that, it's as much a shift in the mental model as it is a shift in how you wire the boxes on a bit of paper. So we're talking about going from organisations which have quite a rigid hierarchical blueprint where people fulfil a role in a faculty, a role in a department, and where leaders are the people that delegate tasks and move things forward, to a role where they're more organic, where you're encouraging people in one faculty to connect with people in another and find ways to work together, where leaders are encouraging that kind of that direction and setting up the system, helping it to work smoothly, and where actually what you're doing is exposing everybody to an amount of uncertainty. So they will have to be comfortable in uncertainty in order to stay flexible and get to the right and to co-design co the future. So it's as much a shift in mental model and in terms of how you think about organisations as it is a, a shift in organisation structure. So in rebuilding, are there more effective ways of structuring your departments and your faculties? I think, can you use that growth to build the culture you want to see? So is it relevant? Do you need to have a more flexible culture? Um, how do you use that? How do you use this to do it? And then are you encouraging modern leadership approaches? The nature of being a leader in a hybrid agile world is very different to the nature of being a leader in the world we've, we've been living in for, for the past decades and how do you encourage that as a different way forward i'm going to stop talking but i think in summary you're rebuilding the workforce against a background of huge change and there are some quite big questions that are probably worth asking for all of you as you go into that process about how you enable and support your universities to change in a in the right way. Kerry, handing back to you, I think. Thank you. I think we're back to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, lovely. Great. Thank you, Graham. Um, yeah, we do have a question that's come through. Sometimes the questions take a bit of longer to come through, so we just wait a little bit longer as well. But the first question I have for you is are universities likely to completely change teaching and learning model to allow tutors to teach from anywhere at any time e.g you don't have to relocate to the uk from any part of the world but you can be employed by a university and teach from your home country effectively I think that's a really interesting question um and i think the answer is probably it depends so I think there are certainly some courses and some faculties where that could well be the model and there could be real advantages in that, um, given that you'd have to find ways of getting around the time zones and a lot of the learning would therefore be prescriptive. So there are definitely opportunities to do that. It's probably less likely in things like medical schools where there's a high level of kind of interpersonal relationship and face-to-face -face learning that has to take place. But I think, yes, that is certainly one option. I think the, the interesting follow up is what does that mean for talent? Because actually that will put the talent pool of people who are really brilliant at teaching or researching in these areas um, under a lot of pressure and the costs for that talent pool, talent pool will become higher. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think the answer is probably yes. There will be occasions where your talent strategy might say we don't really care where people are based. We're going to make that learning remote. We're going to support them to do it from the States or from the Far East or wherever they're based and we'll leverage that in the UK. But I think the interesting question is how do you attract that talent? How do you 
develop it? How do you reward it and how do you retain it once you've got it? OK, thank you, Graham. Thanks for answering that. Um, I'm just checking to see if we have any more questions coming through. Remember to submit them on the Q&A box on the right hand side. Um, like I said, sometimes they do take a bit longer to come through after you've submitted them. So I'm just going to um, just refresh my screen a couple of times just to make sure we haven't got any more coming in. Um, However, if they do arrive slightly later, we can pass those on to Graham for you and he can answer those questions. Oh, hold on. oh, <laughs> that was a, a reply from Francis to say thank you very much for your for your answer, Graham. Oh, that's a question that she submitted. Um, let's just check one more time. Obviously, if there are, like I said, if there are any questions you have, you can submit them later or throughout the session um, to to get answered after. OK, I don't seem to have any more at the moment. So thank you, Graham. Thank you for your time. It's OK, you're oh, welcome. I just hold there, hold for a okay. second. I think we might just have one at the last minute before we go. <laughs> I hope uh, it's not a difficult one. Uh, let's just see. Hold on a second. OK, so we have another question before you go. Are you seeing any differences between remote working being desired by support staff versus academics? We are seeing academics are keen to get back to their offices and labs, whereas support staff are keen to keep working from home. Um, yes, there are there are undoubtedly differences. I think it's probably a bit simple to say it's a difference between academics and support staff. I think there are differences between staff at different levels in the organisation and different tenures, different seniorities, different types of, of resources. I th that then drives an interesting tension, doesn't it, about how people want to work and how they work with each other in different environments. And it's really important to think through as organisations, if you are enabling your academics to come back to, to their offices, to come back to the labs quicker, actually, what are their expectations around the support model around other people being there to support, to support them and to deal with them if other people aren't working like that? So it really takes some planning to get Diff a different model in place that fulfills the competing requirements of those people. And the less you put the planning into it, what you will end up with is academics in their office feeling frustrated that the support staff aren't there when they need them and support staff feeling like they're disconnected from the academics. So I think there is definitely a difference in answer to your question, how you manage that difference is going to be really, really important in how successful you are going forward. Great, thank you, Graham. We actually do have another question for you, if you don't Good. mind. Um, They're flying in are, now. <laughs> They're flying in now. Are there any models for adopting agile working structures that can help address cultural barriers? Um, so that, yes, there are. So actually agile is, becoming an increasingly kind of codified model of organisation design. So it's relatively easy to say we're going to implement Agile and therefore we need squads and we need chapters and we need different models of work. Where the cultural bit is the hard bit to fix. And actually, if you look at organisations which have gone hard at Agile, so in banking and that kind of stuff, where it really works, they address those cultural barriers and they support people through it because people do have to be more flexible. People do have to be comfortable in managing in a different way. People do have to be comfortable with not waiting until things are perfect to push a product or a service or a support model out. That it's a very rolling, quick process. So the cultural challenge is the big challenge. There are models of support for it. There are learning. There is learning that people can do about. You know, human centred design, about um, ways of working, about leadership, about just how agile works, that will really help to address that. Um, but it, it's, I would say it's more of a cultural challenge than it is a structural challenge for organisations. But I, I do think actually just to build on that, within universities there's a real opportunity there because one of the challenges, as long as I've worked at the university, has been the differing perspectives of leaders and academics and support staff and departments. And that cultural challenge of Agile will require you to address that and to get those people working in a different way 
together collaboratively to relatively short term goals. So I think it's a big opportunity for the sector as well as a challenge. Great, thank you, Graham. Thank you very much for your, I don't have any more questions coming in at the moment, I don't think. Let me just have a quick look. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Oh, I do have another one. <laughs> I'm not going to let you go just yet. <laughs> it's all right. I can't see this, so I'm operating completely blind. <laughs> OK, let me just publish that so the so the viewers can see. Um, did you uh, do you know if the private sector industry is looking at these major changes in the ways as much as HE? It feels that in some ways HE is just catching up with the private sector. Um, the private sector is definitely looking at these changes. Um, are they looking at them in a consistent way? Definitely not. Um, so you will have seen no doubt in the news Goldman Sachs came out and said they want their people back in the office as quickly as they can get them in the office. Barclays are forecasting massive remote working in the future and are really focusing on that. So there are different strategies emerging, but the private sector is definitely thinking about it and is definitely um, driving that agenda and is accelerating that agenda actually as we get to vaccines and we get to a route out of the pandemic. I think where they are ahead of universities is in the adoption of the technology around it. So they are that kind of collaboration tool of not just Teams, but things like Microsoft Viva, which use artificial intelligence to share information at the right time in the right way with people. They're much and their kind of back office structures, ERPs, which are more self-service based, give them better data on their people, the ability to survey their whole workforce. I think they're ahead in a technology sense. But frankly, I think they're still wrestling with exactly the same problems that you're wrestling with, which is different parts of our workforce want to work in different ways. And how do we wrangle all that into a model that works and helps us be successful as organisations? Thank you, Graham. Yeah, I think that is our final question. Thank you so much for you are very the time welcome. Today. Yes, and thank you for answering those questions um, so clearly. Um, as with these things, unfortunately, we do have some technical issues with the second speaker, which was Shane Brooker from the OECD. However, we can share his presentation with you and his slides. But I will just let you know a bit about Shane himself. Um, he is a senior economist at the OECD which was the Organisation for Economic Co-Development, sorry, Cooperation and Development. And in his presentation, he will be looking at AI and its place in rebuilding the workforce. He discusses that businesses, including universities, have been forced to embrace concepts and practices that they might not have done um, before in an effort to keep themselves relevant. In his presentation, he will ask, is it the right time to embrace AI to assist in rebuilding the workforce? Hello, my name is Stein Brücke. I am a senior economist at the OECD, but I am in charge of the organization's Future Work Initiative. Now, for those of you not familiar with the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, we are an international organization, and our motto is creating better policies for better lives. How do we do this? We provide a forum for our member countries to discuss challenges they face, to discuss solutions and best practice. We do economic research, and based upon our research, we advise our member governments on how to create better policies. We work on a range of issues from trade and agriculture to energy and the environment. And in the case of my directorate, we focus on labor markets. Now, in my presentation today, I will talk a little bit about the future work and the key trends that we are seeing in the labor market and what that means for changes in skills needs. And then in the second half of my presentation, I will home in on some recent develop developments that we've seen in artificial intelligence. And what that means, not only for the labor market, but more specifically for the human resource function and the recruitment function. Now, many of you may have seen stories out there about the risk of automation, how robots and algorithms will take over tasks, will take over jobs that we humans are currently doing. I show you a few cover here, covers here of magazines 
that span the last 10 years. But these are actually stories that go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years in some cases. There's nothing new about this. But what's interesting is that some very respected academics also back up some of these worries around automation. From the University of Oxford, we've had studies from Frey and Osborne, who've estimated that in the United States, over the next 20 years, up to 50% of jobs could disappear as a result of automation. In the United States, academics at the University of Stanford have said that there's never been a worse time to be a worker with ordinary skills because computers, robots, and other digital technologies are acquiring these skills and abilities at an extraordinary rate. Now, despite these risks, I want to show you that, in fact, on average in the labor market, we have seen employment growth and not a reduction in employment. And this is, I won't go into the details, primarily because, yes, technology destroys some jobs, but it creates more and better jobs as well. This chart is too small for you to see, to see the detail, but let me explain to you what it shows. It shows you for every single OECD country what employment growth there has been over the period 2012 to 2019. So every single bar represents a different OECD country. And you can see that in every single country, there has been growth in employment over this period, despite automation, despite the adoption of robots and algorithms. The black bar is the UK. It shows you an increase close to the OECD average of over 10% in employment over this period. Now, you might say this is a period that encompasses the recovery from the financial crisis. So of course, you would see employment growth, and that is true, but it's not the only story that's going on here. In fact, if you look at the trend in employment growth over longer time periods, so going back 10, 20, 30 years, you still see an increase in employment in almost every single OECD country. This is a very positive story overall, but underneath the surface of this positive story, there's a lot of turmoil, a lot of change. And this is what the next graph shows you. What I do here is I break down the employment growth by education. So I look at the growth in jobs for high educated individuals, for middle educated individuals, and for low educated individuals. The blue bars show you the growth in jobs for high educated individuals. And you can see that in every single country that I show in this graph, there has been growth in the jobs for high educated workers. In the UK, I'll show you in the red bar here, there's an increase of 22% in jobs for high educated workers just in the period between 2012 and 2019. The black bars show you the jobs for low educated workers. And in most OECD countries, there's been a decline in the jobs for these workers. The UK is actually an interesting exception here because there's still been growth in the number of jobs for low educated workers as well. And I'll come back to this in a second. Now, this shows you growth by level of qualification, but let's dig a little deeper into what it actually means. What types of qualifications, what skills are increasingly in demand in the labor market and what skills and qualifications are less in demand? This is what I'll show you in this graph. This graph is for, you, for the United Kingdom, and we look at qualifications. We look at skills and abilities that are in high demands, where there's a shortage, which is on the left of this chart, and then at qualifications and skills that are in excess, in other words, where there's little demand but high supply, on the right side of this graph. Now, what do you see? You see that qualifications that are in high demand include education and training, engineering and technology, health services, mathematics and science. Skills that are in high demand include complex problem solving, reasoning abilities, visual abilities, whereas skills that are in less demand or qualifications that are in less demand are manufacturing and production, things like physical strength. Now, one interesting fact about this graph for the UK is that, in fact, there's a shortage in almost all qualifications and all skills, even in some of the lower level skills. And that's not necessarily a story we see in all OECD countries. In fact, in other OECD countries, we see more here on the right hand side of the graph. In other words, we see more skills and qualifications where there's an excess and not in the UK. So there's a real shortage of skills in the UK. And this is only going to get worse also with population aging. This graph shows you the um, the old age dependency ratio. So it shows you the ratio of the number of people aged 65 and over over the working age population. Right now, 
there's about three older people for every working age person, uh, for every 10 working age that people. But you see that this ratio will increase from 0.3 to 0.4 by 2060. Now, this will make the skills issue or the skills landscape much more complicated because many older workers have skills that are needed in the labor market. These people will retire and there will be a need to replace these skills without necessarily having population growth. So this accentuates the skill shortage issue that I've shown you in the previous graph. Now, let's look at a little bit closer at what technologies have been doing and who they have been affecting. In the past, the kind of technologies that we've seen, the automating technologies that we've seen, tended to automate tasks or where they were able to do tasks that were routine, they could be easily programmed. And these tended to be middle to lower skilled kind of tasks. This graph shows you the risk of automation by skill level. You can see here in the United Kingdom that if you're a high skilled individual, you have a risk of automation of 6% in your job. So 6% chance that your job will disappear in the next 20 years as a result of automation. Whereas if you're a low skilled individual, that risk goes up to 20%. So it's about three times as high as for a high skilled individual. But there is an interesting change happening in the labor market. The new technologies that, are, that, that we are seeing develop, the new technologies that are being adopted by employers actually are now having an impact on higher skilled people as well. And that's the case of artificial intelligence. So in this graph, I show you an estimate of the exposure that different occupations have to artificial intelligence. What do we see? The kinds of occupations, the kinds of professions that are most exposed to AI include business professionals, people working in IT, IT professionals, chief executives, scientists, and engineers. Whereas the occupations least exposed include those like cleaners, agricultural workers, food preparation assistants. As I said, this is because previous technologies tended to target primarily routine tasks, middle skilled tasks, whereas AI is capable of doing non-routine and cognitive tasks. Now, exposure is not necessarily a bad thing. Let me give you the example of a cardiologist. AI is already better than most cardiologists in identifying cancers, for example. Does that mean that the cardiologist will lose his or her job? No, more likely, it's going to make that person more efficient, better at their job, reduce the false positives that they come up with, and it will allow them to focus on other kinds of tasks, more human tasks of talking to patients and advising them and prescribing treatments uh, and looking at the more human touch of their profession. So artificial intelligence may actually be complementary to many high skilled occupations, high skilled workers. Let me give you an example that's perhaps closer to home to the higher education sector, which is Semantic Scholar. Now Semantic Scholar is an artificial intelligence based search engine for academic publications. It uses natural language processing to provide summaries for scholarly papers. And in particular, one interesting feature that they introduced in November last year was the too long didn't read feature. What this does is it uses artificial intelligence to provide single sentence summaries of complex computer science papers. And it, again, it does this using natural language processing. Now, if you're an academic, you can look at this in two ways. On the one hand, you might think a large part of my job is actually looking up papers and trying to summarize them. And this is now being done automatically. This is a high skilled task. On the, on the other hand, you could say, this actually saves me a lot of time and I can spend more time on other more productive activities, like the writing, the thinking. Now, what is artificial intelligence? I've mentioned it a few times. We have a definition at the OECD, which says that a machine, it's a machine-based system that can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. Now, this is, in my view, a rather abstract definition. There are also many other definitions out there, and I'm not sure there is actually one shared definition. In fact, AI encompasses a whole range of technologies. If you talk to specialists, they don't even like the term intelligence. They prefer talking uh, or referring to the specific technology that's involved. In many cases, that technology is machine learning. Um, and basically, thanks to advances in computing power, advances in, in data collection, 
we have made significant advances in artificial or machine learning, I should say, rather, in recent years. And what's really, I think, different about machine learning as opposed to previous technologies is that we no longer have a computer scientist that's coding the program. It's, it's the machine itself, it's the algorithm itself that learns from the data, that identifies patterns in the data, and then that gives us, the user, recommendations or gives us patterns, gives us predictions that we can use in our job. Now, the human resource function, and recruitment in particular, is actually an area where artificial intelligence has, one, made significant advances in recent years, and where it's already being adopted quite widely amongst employers as well, because artificial intelligence can be used in the four stages of recruitment. To give you just a few examples, instead of companies collecting in an old-fashioned way CVs and then doing interviews themselves, using cover letters. and In fact, artificial intelligence can already identify vacancies. It can profile uh, candidates. It can target candidates and adverts out there. It can do skills assessments of people who apply for the job. It can do pre-screen the candidates. It can drop an interview schedule. It can even do the interviews itself. It, and doing the interviews, it can draw on facial data. It can analyze voice, tone, choice of words, in the psychological assessments, it can respond to inquiries through chatbots, and some chatbots then actually analyze the responses and the responses the candidates give. It can provide feedback to candidates. Once the recruitment is over, it can help with onboarding. It can help with performance management. It's already being used in also internal uh, employee referrals. It's used in career advancement. It's used in identifying training needs and suggesting training that individuals can follow in order to advance their careers. So there are many applications already of artificial intelligence and many use cases that are already out there. There are tools that people can buy off the shelf to use in human resource management within the firm. Why do firms do this? Because actually there are a lot of advantages to using artificial intelligence. I've read somewhere that in the US at least, for every open position, the average cost per hire is over $4,000. So obviously, there's a big incentive here to reduce costs and artificial intelligence can help with that. The other aspect of artificial intelligence is that in a recruitment process, there are often lots of repetitive, administrative, data-heavy tasks, such as gathering CVs, checking candidate profiles against a list of required skills. And artificial intelligence can do these tasks. They can relieve workers of these tasks so that workers and the, recruit, the recruitment officials can focus more on tasks that require a human touch. Artificial intelligence, because it uses so much more information and does it in a systematic way, can result in better matches. It can, in particular, identify and help with the identification of competencies beyond just a standard CV. It can do this a lot faster, certainly, than humans can. And it can, as a result, process a larger pool of candidates, which again brings us back, back to the point of achieving better matches in recruitment. There's also an argument that we're no longer relying on an individual to make choices in terms of recruitment. And so that could lead to less bias, although there's also risks, and I will come back to that in my next slide. Now, it's clear that there are many advantages. And if you think about some of the large job search platforms like monster.com or LinkedIn, they already use artificial intelligence in their matching algorithms. Clearly, if these firms see an advantage to AI, there must be advantages to other recruitment professionals as well. Of course, this may all sound too good to be true. And I won't deny there are significant risks involved as well with artificial intelligence. And let me just list a few of them. One risk is perhaps obvious if you have more candidates applying or that you've identified, there's also more to go through and there's increased frictions, which in a way could increase some of the costs in recruitment. There's also a risk, if you rely too much on artificial intelligence, that you lose some of the human touch. Now here, it's clearly a question of balance. Human touch in, artificial, in, in recruitment will remain important, such as assessing the cultural fit of candidates, um, creating a rapport with candidates, doing negotiations with them. There are also questions about reliability, especially in the, with the tools, uh, the AI tools that use facial expressions and movements. In fact, 
there's already been there's some research out there that shows that some of these tools are less well at identifying and could be discriminatory based on ethnicity. And so this brings you into the issue of bias. Even though you're taking the human out of the loop, you must remember that artificial intelligence is based on past data. And whatever bias in recruitment is embedded in that past data will just be repeated going forward. Or it could identify new areas of bias. I mean, for example, it could be that the AI identifies, just to say something random, that people with blue eyes tend to perform better at the job. And so it may randomly favor those candidates, even though it has nothing to do with employee performance later on. Then there come the questions of accountability. If a wrong decision is taken, who is accountable? If a discriminatory decision is taken, who is accountable? Is it the recruitment officer or is it the person who originally designed the AI? There are questions around privacy. Some artificial intelligence recruitment tools that are out there will go through candidates' social media profiles online and gather data that can be used for recruitment. There are clearly issues around privacy involved there. There may also be a bigger challenge for low-skilled candidates in navigating some of these tools. If you're a high-skilled candidate, you might be more familiar with the kind of tools that are being used in recruitment that are based on AI, and you may know better how to handle them. Whereas if you're a low-skilled individual, you might be disadvantaged. There are also, there's a whole issue around the complexity of um, HR phenomena. If you think about human resource performance, or, or if you think about what makes a good employee, it's very difficult to define that with very basic, in a way, data that you collect on individuals. Yet artificial intelligence will base its decisions on this, these data. And it is a question whether these data will actually reflect the full performance of individuals later on in the job. And this brings us back to what artificial intelligence is. It's data science, and it's about identifying patterns. It's not necessarily about causal relationships. Remember the example about blue eyes that I gave you just a few seconds ago. And this brings us to a final key issue here, is that artificial intelligence will only be as good as the underlying data that feeds it. If you have small data sets, if you, the artificial intelligence is based on only a few recruitment examples in the past, then it's unlikely to be able to do a good job predicting good performance or good recruitments in the future. Take the higher education sector. If you think about using artificial intelligence in just one department in one university, then you're dealing with a very small data set. But if the artificial intelligence is being trained across all departments and across all universities, then it may well become a very powerful tool in identifying good matches for the vacancies that you have. Now, the final point I want to make is that there are also barriers to artificial intelligence in terms of the adoption. One of these is that many universities or many employers in general often still have poor digital infrastructure, which impedes them from adopting these kinds of technologies. And related to that, staff may not always have the skills and the training required for using these technologies and understanding these technologies, because sometimes there may be a blind faith put in these technologies, and that would be the wrong thing. The idea is that they become a tool to help better decision making. And I've already mentioned that one, that the, the benefits of artificial intelligence really only come to the fore when you have very good data underlying it. And where there is no data or a lack of data, it's not clear that artificial intelligence presents any advantages yet over more traditional ways of recruitment. So just some concluding remarks. Artificial intelligence is clearly not a silver bullet. It's not magical. In fact, the human touch in recruitment will remain important. It always will. But where we do see opportunities is where artificial intelligence is being used by recruitment officials to make better decisions. There are certain things that AI can do that humans cannot do, or there are certain things that AI can do better and faster, more efficient than humans can do. So if humans accept that and use artificial intelligence to do those tasks, while they then focus on other more human touch based uh, tasks, then you have a winning team. And in a way, artificial intelligence can almost be used to 
look back at some recruitment decisions that have been taken in the past. It can check some of these recruitment decisions. So again, it's about complementarity between humans and the machine. You also need to be very careful about what some of these off-the-shelf products claim they can do. Artificial intelligence, as I said, is not magic. It can do certain things. And we need to be realistic about what it can achieve. And finally, there are already some laws in European countries, in the US, about warning candidates when artificial intelligence is being used in recruitment. That's only fair that people know that there is a machine there that will assess some of their competencies. There's a machine there that will make recommendations. And there should also be options for candidates to opt out from that. So I come to the end of my presentations. I hope I've given you at least some insights into what might happen in the recovery from the crisis as we look towards the future and what that means for higher education, what some of the risks are, what some of the opportunities are. Now, to finish, I leave you my contact details and I do invite you to get in touch in case you have any further questions. I'll be happy to set up a chat or answer your questions. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening and see you soon. So thank you for joining us today. That does conclude our webinar session for today. And thank you for Graham for actually uh, for, for getting through on the technology. And, and um, you know, we hope that you will join us again next week, which will be our HR Managers Forum. So that's next Thursday, the 18th from 12 o'clock. And this is a really great opportunity to submit your questions is open to you. So anything you want to talk about, any pressing topics or conversations you want to open up about recruitment in higher education, you can submit your questions um, over the next week or during the session, but over the next week will be fantastic. And you can send them to webmarketing at warwick.ac.uk. And as many questions as possible would be fantastic. So again, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Thank you for Graham for being here. And on behalf of everyone at Jobs AC, thank you, and we see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.